shame is a prison as cruel as a grave. Shame is a robber and he's come to take my name. Oh, love is my redeemer, lifting me up from the ground. Love is the power where my freedom song is found. There ain't no
out of the grave I'm a walking to if you walked out of the grave I'm a walking to if you walked out of the grave I'm a walking to if you walked out of the grave I'm walking to I'm following Jesus if you walked out Please be seated. I sing that song or, or bits of it all the time, including at the produce section at the grocery store where I scare people sometimes. <laughs> Checking out celery. You walked out of the grave, I'm a walking too. It is a, a, a beautiful, powerful song. Sometimes history is changed in headline-making ways. Let me throw a few that we share out. The Allies invaded Normandy today. It is D-Day. President Kennedy was shot and has died in Dallas, Texas. Airplanes have hit the Twin Towers and they both come down. There are watershed changes in the fabric of humanity and in the direction that history will go. And there is a distinct before and after the ones that I have mentioned today, and really you could list thousands if you were a historian. When we become aware of those changes, it changes not only how we are and, and how we exist, but how we think about the future and how we reckon with the past. In short, everything changes. Each one of us here have watershed moments in our personal histories that have done the same thing. It's just that they're yours privately and mine. In our family, the watershed moment growing up, and it was brought up all of the time, was when your father died. And our history was told to us, the history of our little family was told to us in this way. Before your father died, everything was great. 
after your father died, nothing was any good. So I understood with a childlike logic that the whole world changed for me without voice or vote when my father died. It's a watershed moment that stayed with me for a very long time. Yours might be the same, the death of a parent, but it also might be before the cancer, my life was this way, and since then, it is different. Before the divorce, I thought everything was going to be great, and now it's hard. I don't know everyone's watershed moments. I just know that we all have them. It's not possible to live without events that change the course of our lives and change how we understand our lives. And on one level deeper, change how we feel about the fact of our lives. Today, we're going to look in Scripture at a watershed moment, and I, I want to broaden my scope a little bit. Let me give you just a little history and tell you how people outside of the faith tradition view the story of Cain and Abel. There are some interesting things in Cain and Abel. The, the most uh, commented upon is that the writer of the story or writers of the story bother to tell us that one was a farmer and one was a herder or a hunter. So when historians look at what are called etiological stories, and that's what this is, remember it's prehistory, no, no one was there. It, it's a story that, that undergirds the faith and, and is presented in Scripture because it teaches a fundamental lesson about our existence and about our God. So when historians are looking at, at etiological stories that are shared throughout many uh, different traditions, Cain and Abel is one of the most important. A and what they do with it, I think, is fascinating and, and good for us to know. S so the historians who, who make it their, their lives' uh, work to break these things down, they believe that Cain and Abel might be one of the oldest stories common to almost all of humanity. And they believe that it refers ve very distinctly to an historical event or, or a, a series of, of historical events, and a, an epic in uh, early, early, early human development that was so life-changing that it was passed down verbally first in Mesopotamia and in and through their society and then carried by Abram and, and the Semites out of Mesopotamia and stayed a part of the tradition until it finally arrived in our scripture. And, and here is that a, event. You, you have heard of it. You're aware of it. Most of us just haven't thought very deeply about it. Historians believe that the story is a primary story that describes the time in human development when hunter-gatherers were forced to give way to settled communities. So you know, in the early days of humanity, they hunted and, and gathered, and they moved with the animals, or sometimes they, they moved according to the season with where they knew they could get tubers or, or other things uh, from, from the ground. But they were, in modern language, free, right? Except they had to follow the animals, but they got up and, and they could stay in camp or they could break camp and go. That was the nature of, of humanity for a very, very long time. We don't know why or what the circumstances were that caused them to abandon that lifestyle. But you know that in Mesopotamia, at least as far as what we know now, for the very first time in human history, they quit wandering they settled down between the two great rivers, very fertile, and, and they began to form communities, and those communities no longer dependent on the skill of the hunter or the bounty of, of whatever land they were wandering through. The, the communities lived or died by the harvest. Had never happened before. And again, no one knows for sure why they made that decision. It severely limited all kinds of things that we still today hold as high value, primarily freedom. Your freedom went away when you quit being a hunter-gatherer and you were locked into a community. Then here's the most fascinating part from a theological perspective of, of that, that event. If you take people who have been free all of their lives and who have likely 
several skill sets that is good for the wandering community, and you put them in a plot of ground and build a wall around them and tell them, if the wheat doesn't come in, we all die, and you are assigned now to be the one who weeds the field or to be the one who... uh, uses the grinding stone so when the wheat comes in we can make flour for it or you are the one that's in charge of guarding the city from wandering bands of people who are still out there wandering. Everything that human beings knew before community was changed with the advent of community and the worst part of it wasn't just specialization. Specialization, right? If your grandfather was a hunter-gatherer he could do all kinds of stuff. If you are a, a mill grinder, that's what you know, and you don't have the skills to go out and wander anymore. But worse than that, when you gather human beings into community for the first time, then self-defense of the whole community becomes the rule of the day, and when that becomes the rule of the day because you're suddenly in danger from other human beings in a way you never have been before, you create a strata of importance. If you're in a community for the first time ever, you need a king or a ruler or a great warrior. And if you have one of those, what is the the job? His job is to tell other people what they have to do. Can you feel the weight of, of what has happened to humanity begin to sit on your shoulders? Suddenly, born free is not to stay free. Now it is, well, if the big guy says, I have to do this, I have to do this. If he says, I got to pick up my sword and, and go out and, and fight, I, I got to do that. What was known in humanity for a very long time was a a kind of brutal freedom and it was taken away from us by a series of events that we don't understand when we settled into communities. Communities are a hardship on human beings because they so limit natural freedoms and they elevate one person or a group of people over all others. That means that in community for the first time ever some human beings became gods at least in their view and some people became slaves at least in their view so what historians think when they look and they unpack that part of kind of natural history of the world is they think that likely the cataclysmic event that happened after forced settlement was that For the first time, tribes that had roamed together and were, at least in their own understanding, fiercely loyal and in love with each other and defended themselves against anything else. For the first time, those tribes, when they were settled into the early communities, turned on each other, fratricide. And for the first time in history, people who were born to be in the same tribe and to wander and and to roam this earth in the normal way hated one another because of the change in status, because of the limitation of freedoms, and they took first blood. In other words, the settlement of humanity into communities in ancient Mesopotamia put in place the reality that caused human beings to turn against their own kin and for the first time to kill with intent. And it was such a horrifying sequence of events that the elders in that time, in the midst of history when those things happened, they imprinted it on their children and grandchildren and they did the same for thousands of years until finally it got into the written record it's in the Mesopotamian written record before it is in ours but it carries clear down to our written record we lose the offense of the thing because we're born you're either a god or a slave as you sit here today if you're in charge of everybody and everything you know uh, kudos to you and if you're not sorry they decided that a long time ago before they even had ballots It's such a massive change in the course of humanity when one brother decides that their only path is to take the life of the other brother. So that's, historians and archaeologists agree, right, that the settling of communities, even though we're so used to it, we forget, was not actually a wondrous thing. It was a hardship on on people who had been free, and, and you might have it in your mind today, right? We're still the same way. I don't like it when anybody curtails my freedoms. I do not like it. Sometimes it's even good for me, and I still don't care because I don't want to have somebody else in charge of me. Can I get an amen? 
So it has ever been. So the story gets told and eventually gets recorded in Mesopotamia, and Abram and the Semites who will leave Mesopotamia to found their new faith and to follow their God, they keep it alive and they tell their children, and the story becomes enmeshed in humanity's understanding. We call this series, right, more than children's stories because somehow we've kind of lost the flavor of the thing to the point where it becomes a morality tale. You should be nice to your brother and, and, and not fight if your uh, mom doesn't like the job you did clean your room. It's crazy. It's a watershed event. It divides all of history. Let me put it to you in theological terms as best I can. The reason that it has stayed in the human family and continues to be a story of note in, in our tradition and in our understanding of ourselves and God and, and, and life can be seen not just because it was the shedding of innocent blood, but it's the first time, whatever happened, it was the first time that human beings acted as God. To take upon yourself the power to determine the end of another human life is a God-like action. And the first time it happened, it was so shocking that we still, even if we tend at this late stage to forget about it, still find it necessary to remember. If you let your mind go back a little bit into the last couple of weeks, in the garden, the etiological story there says that the, the trouble began when Adam and Eve ate from the tree of the fruit of knowledge, and that knowledge was of what is good and what is evil, and the snake describes it as, well, if you eat of that, you'll become like gods. And the first thing that happens in our series of etiological stories after the fall and the casting out of perfection, where Adam and Eve simply roamed around and there was food aplenty, the first thing that happened when they were cast out and they had to settle in is that they begin, in fact, to act like God. They take a life intentionally they make the decision that they are the author of life and death and from that point the fall is catastrophic and continues today makes you a little uneasy doesn't it because i know you're out there thinking what about the just war didn't we kill people in world war ii that really really needed to be uh, uh, killing we're just talking in a general truth the first time a human being decided to end another human being's life for whatever reason, they took the place of God, and we have, in one way or another, assumed that role ever since. The great heroes of history, the great heroes of history, the names everybody knows, they all have this one thing in common. They were famous for having killed more human beings than anyone else up to their day. Let me run the, wrist, uh, the list for you. In our generation, Hitler, a special kind of insanity, and that insanity we should be aware of today. Hitler and his godlike status amongst his people allowed him to launch a plan to eradicate an entire group of people, the Jews, and his plan wasn't just to get rid of them in Berlin or Munich or even in Germany. His plan was to eradicate them completely. That's so insane that it's, it's breathtaking. Unless you remember, oh, once this stuff starts, it, it really never stops. From the river to the sea. There will always be people who believe that they have the authority and the power and the sacred right of God to extinguish other people who displease them for whatever reason. Put in another language... There will always be people acting in the place of God. And what Scripture tells us clearly in the story of Cain and Abel, wow, that is when the trouble started. The minute not only did they think that they were godlike, but they acted like it, the thing got twisted and torn up and made into a mess, and we haven't untangled it yet. Let's read the Scripture together, and I'll talk a little bit more. You guys scare me when you're that quiet. For the record, the, the sermon should be interpreted as a, a speech against the murder of unpopular humans. All right, let's, let's take a look at the story. Genesis 4, 1 through 16. 
Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. That's the beginning of community from the historian's point of view, and it's what happened after they were cast out. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now, Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. Division of labor, and in truth, uh, the beginning of the division of power and import. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. And then the Lord said to Cain, why are, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, hey, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel, and he killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence, and I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. If you recognize it, I hope you do, he, he's just described the human condition from the time of the fall. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. And then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod. Nod means wander, east of Eden. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of Scripture. Can you catch what I'm talking about? The, the story, the etiological story, d describes something that actually seems normal to us, doesn't it? It's not unusual to read a story that in a family one was jealous of the other and they acted against them. It's unusual, I guess, that they would go to the length of, of taking their life, but it's not unusual for sibling rivalry to burst up and to divide people and to cause, wreak havoc in, in the family. But it should be. It should not be the norm. It didn't have to go that way. It really didn't. Conceive with me the story as it might have played out. Two brothers brought an offering to God. One was accepted, one wasn't. The brothers, brother whose offering wasn't accepted, in humility, went to his other brother and congratulated him on making a proper offering and asked if his brother would work with him so that he might too learn how to make a proper offering to God. And together the two brothers worked and discerned how to please the Lord, and the Lord manifested his blessings in their lives, and they went on together in this life. It just as easily could have gone that way. It didn't because of things that we all know, things that make up our story. It didn't because one brother conceived that the problem with his life wasn't what he had been about or what he had done or not done. The problem was his brother. One person decided, you know, this is a problem for me. It makes me unhappy. It makes me feel bad. It makes me whatever. <clears throat> and the answer to the problem is if I kill my brother, then nobody can make a better offering than me. What a gen ge genius solution. You are aware of it, are you not? And you've lived it. I have. And again, don't let me be up here all by myself. Way too many times in my life I've had the exact same thought. Not to kill somebody. But I have thought, you know what's wrong with me? That person right there. So I believe Jesus is calling me to straighten him out. 
And as soon as I straighten them out, my life will be better. It's easy to see the flaw in the logic when we're talking this way on a Sunday morning, isn't it? We do it all the time. We say, you know, the only thing wrong with me is you or them. And so when I have the chance, I'm going to teach them a lesson. I'm going to punish them. I'm going to run them out of business. I'm going to run them out of town. I'm going to whatever it is. We convince ourselves that this insanity that started the ball rolling towards a, a world incessantly at, at war, we convince ourselves that that logic is godly and true. The only thing wrong in this world is other people won't do it or think about it the way I want them to. And so my role in life is to either eliminate them or get them to come around to the way that I think. There's a whole line of jokes, which I'm not allowed to tell on a Sunday morning. The punchline of those jokes is this, and that's when the trouble started. The trouble started when given an opportunity to choose humility and grace and to learn from someone else, the brother made the choice to let jealousy rage, to sit in their own shame and stew about it until they decided the only way to eliminate the way they felt was to kill the one who had outperformed them. And they did that. And then, literally, all hell broke loose. And it broke loose because we went on that day from one God to at least two. And from two, it began to double until you have the mess that we have today. How many public figures in any of the genres, entertainment, politics, literature, whatever you want, how many public figures can you think of who do in fact conduct themselves in a godlike manner and seem to believe that they are better than you and also might believe that it's people like you who are the problem. The list would be endless if we took 10 minutes to write down everybody you could think of, wouldn't it? Now move the scale back closer to home. How many people in your life have harmed you or, or made you feel a deep anger because you understood that they believed they were better than you, inherently better than you, because they're godlike and you're just a slave. How many people in your life have just come along and messed the thing up because they were so arrogant you could hardly stand them? All of us have stories to tell, don't we? Lots of them. Narrow it down more. The equation stays the same. Unfortunately, it never, never ever goes away. In your life, as you sit here in the sanctuary today, how many of us say, you know, fundamentally, it didn't go the way I planned it to go because back then that person did that thing to me and I've never really been able to get up and, and march on and God, I wish I could go back and straighten that thing out. How many of us sitting here today fundamentally believe I can't be fully engaged in the free quest to live the way I want to because my boss, my spouse, my sibling, whoever it might be, is holding me back and keeping me down. They're harming me. And God, I wish there was a way that I could make them go away. I could teach them a lesson. I could stop them. I could punish them. If I could just make them be what I want them to be, then I could finally be free. You recognize, do you not, that I'm just explaining to you where human wisdom comes from. We always think it's somebody else's fault. Again, Hitler in World War II, right? The little knucklehead conceived somehow that in spite of all of the military blunders, all of the nonsense that led to that, that war, it really was the Jews after all. No one anywhere was made better by the extinguishing of six million plus people, were they? What we need to do as followers of the one true God is to understand the story of the first big fall, brother kills brother because a hierarchy has been developed. 
is the only story that exists in Scripture, and it's the only story that exists in our lives. We are deluded to the point that we believe our happiness, our fulfillment, our joy, our walk with Christ, our marriage, our family situation, our work situation, they all could be much better if it weren't for other people. That delusion drives humanity. And it is never true. It's not true. Let's talk about the New Testament now. When we think in those terms, the taking of a life, assuming a godlike power, began the mess, and then we ponder in that way of thinking what God did in history, it should just explode in your heart and in your mind. In order to stop the flow of the nonsense, the, the incessant warring and hatred of other people thinking they are the problems, the Jews expected that God would send a mighty army to finish the job and kill all the bad people, which is an insanity in and of itself. But what God actually did was he came and submitted his life to the greatest power that had ever been. If ever there was a God human, it was Augustus. He submitted his life and they took it because they were powerful enough and godlike enough to do so. And then, in a display of holy and sacred and unquenchable power, he simply rose again, defeating in one fell swoop the whole course of humanity and its insanity, believing that to kill someone else is to make the situation better. That's what we're saying in Christianity. We look at the problem and say, the problem is, right, we just keep killing each other in one way or another, and thinking it's going to fix the thing. And God said clearly through his action of Jesus Christ, it will never work. I am more powerful than your killing desire. In the teachings that Jesus gave us, in the picture he painted of what God actually desired from us, it seems insane. It is insane because we're so enmeshed in the world. My own story as a Christian is, I, I believe that Jesus loved me because who wouldn't, really? But I have been suspicious all of my life about the stuff that he said because I know for a fact it doesn't work. Jesus said, look, if, if you want fulfillment and freedom and peace inside, if you want joy, whatever your circumstance, be you free or slave, if you want what the human heart has always desired, a closeness to God, you can have it. You can have it while your boss is screaming at you. You can have it while people are saying bad things about you. It's all yours to have. It, it only calls on you to find the humility to forgive them. And when you forgive them, they're no longer your God. They can't disturb your dreams. They can't change the way that you act. They lose all of their power, even if they still demonstrate their power by the way they act day after day after day. You can, in fact, be free from them, and you can be free from them in real time. You don't have to wait for heaven to feel better or to have fulfillment or to have peace or to have a sense that your life is really a beautiful gift from the eternal God. You can do it now if you just make the right decision, and the right decision is learn how to actually truly forgive them. I grew up in the church, same as many of you. I heard that message over and over and over, and it always went, because where I come from, that's nonsense. If you go around forgiving people, right, what are they going to do? They're going to take more money the next time, or candy, or your bike. It's insane. It's crazy. It makes no sense, because sense comes from killing. But truth comes from God. He said in Jesus, in the teaching, in the way Jesus conducted himself, in the very fact that he let his son give himself over to the great powers of the earth, he was clearly explaining to us, look, you really have had the power all along. You just keep buying into the lie and not into the truth. Until it seems like it's impossible, a heroic act to, to actually conceive of living into the truth. One more time. The story went, one brother got jealous and killed the other brother, thinking that would solve it. Didn't solve anything. Story could have gone. 
one brother had the good sense to go to the other brother and say, wow, how did you do that? That was fantastic. I'm so glad for you. Teach me how to make an acceptable offering. And then the two brothers would have been bound even tighter than they were before. But it didn't go that way. The watershed event was, it went the way it went, and all we've ever done is find better ways to kill one another, whether that's literally physically killing one another, or harming reputations, or undercutting, or whatever things we've devised to try to make our life better by making other people change. It is insane. It seems dangerous. It seems crazy. It seems like it could never possibly work to do what we've been asked to do, to work on humility, confessing our own sins, and to conceive that what we really need to change when it comes to the people that harm us is us. It just doesn't seem like it will work. But even a dabbling in actual Christianity, the spiritual exercise of being obedient to God as best you can, even just the tiniest little bit of trouble that you extend in that way, I promise you will yield results the likes of which you've been looking for all of your life. Scripture says, look, if you walk in the Spirit of God, you'll receive the fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, humility, self-control. And those can only be attained when you're free to receive them. And you can only be free to receive them on any profound level by letting go of the lie. Your life today is not less than it should be because of what someone else has said or done to you. If your life is less than you believe it should be, it is because of how you have reacted to what other people did. It's as simple and difficult as that. God offers to those who will listen freedom, and freedom that results in a sense of fulfillment, a joy in others, hope that goes beyond reason, and the belief that the life that he has created for us had indeed holy and sacred purpose. He offers to us a chance to live as fully as those first human beings before the fall came, and generation after generation after generation, we default to saying, I can't trust the actual God. I need to stand in God's place. I'll take care of this. And we haven't ever. We talk about it a lot in the church. And we talk about it a lot in the church because the other is talked about all of the time. Have you ever gone to somebody in confidence and said, I, I need some help with this problem. This person is just driving me insane, right? What they're doing is wrong, and i got to figure out how to stop them. And then that person said, let's figure that out. We can leverage power here. We can hurt them there. We can confront them. We can beat them down. We can do whatever. We can make it stop. Most people have had that conversation on some level. If you did and you followed through, ask yourself today, honestly, did anything get better? No, nothing did. In fact, you got worse because you became more godlike and you decided I can control it. I can make other people do what I want. Okay. <clears throat> Before your father died, we used to buy a new car every four years. Man, that must have been gravy, you know? Before your father died, we bought this house that we live in and we had a ranch and it was wonderful after your father died stevie well we don't have any money we lost the horses the ranch is gone here is my observation of my mother's life her reality was that the death of dad forced her into a situation where she acted frequently out of line with what is good and she blamed always his unfortunate death. But if I examine the evidence closely, I have to say she was just fundamentally wrong. She believed in a fairy tale. 
She believed if he had lived that all of her life would have been some wondrous thing. You might know it's hard to be married in the best of circumstances. And they didn't have the best of circumstances. But my mother, in the situation that she was put into by that cataclysmic event, became a woman that was much, much more holy and much more in line with what Christ taught than she ever could have been when her values were that more money makes a better life. Because circumstantially, she became a servant. She was an incredible servant. She hated almost every second of it, as far as I can tell. But she devoted her life to making sure we were fed and clothed and we had at least as much as the other poor kids in school. She gave the rest of her life away to the single cause of living for the good of her children in the best way that she possibly could. And my observation is, in the last years of her life, my mom was a much more whole and peace-filled and joyful woman than she could possibly have been had she gotten everything she wanted. Dad lived and they had lots of stuff. And she was that way because she was put into a place where she lived out, whether or not it was a happy, holy thing or not, exactly what Christ says to live out. If you're the mother of five kids, you've got to do some amount of forgiving on a daily basis for what the kids are up to. You know that's true, right? You just got to bite your lip and, and keep bringing the baloney to the table. The circumstances that she detested because it so changed the life that she thought she wanted to live actually became the most beautiful thing in her life and they created in her, in time, a spirit that I still love and thank God that was a part of my life. She was wrong all those years about what a blessing is. And we are too. Our lives will not be better when we can make other people do what we want. They just won't. If you're thinking that today, please stop. Your life will get better when you conform, have the humility, and when you praise God by taking the step to do the things that he taught us. It all started with one decision to kill another. A man became God and took the life of another. And it all changed again cataclysmically and wonderfully when one offered his life up to be taken and then through the power of God rose up, walked out of the grave, and said to the world, you do not have to give your life to the rule of tyrants. You just don't. You can be free. In Holy Communion, we always talk about the meaning of the action of Jesus' death. Yes, it was sacrificed for your sins. Yes, it was sacrificed for the sins of the world. Absolutely, it's a bloody, terrible affair what sin does to us, especially the sin of being godlike and wanting to change everybody else. When we see the brokenness of Christ on the cross, it is possible to understand what we're seeing is our own attitudes towards our life on display. If I could just change those people or pay them back or make them do my bidding, everything would be better. No, it would not. And when we remember not only the shedding of his blood, but that through the power of God, through the indescribable power of forgiveness, the reaction to the godlike status and power of Rome and the Sanhedrin was God mocked them by standing up, walking out of the grave, and continuing to bless his disciples, just like the emperor really wasn't God, because he wasn't. And whoever, whoever you have in your heart and your mind today that you think is keeping you from being what God intended, they're not God either. It's incumbent upon you to have the wisdom and the courage and the faith to confess that. You can begin today as we take Holy Communion. You receive a symbolic act for the forgiveness of your sins. I want you to be mindful that your sin is not just stuff that you do that can be on a checklist, right? I, I didn't cuss this week. Well, it isn't a checklist of good things and bad things. The essence of human sin is the belief that your life has been handed over to some other people or person and that what you really need is for them to cease and desist. If that's your sin, confess it today when you go to God. Just say the words, Father, I, I confess to you that I have thought you fill in the blank is the problem and, and I have chafed and given my life over to them and, and my sin is I have acted like they were God and they're not, you are. 
That's the primary sin of the human family. Let God be God. Let him restore you. Have the faith to do what he asked you to do. Ask for forgiveness and then give forgiveness. And I promise you, honestly, all of the things that Christianity is about, they will become abundantly clear and true faster than you can possibly imagine. When Jesus walked out of the grave and his disciples saw him and he began again to love and to share with them, history changed for the first time in tens of thousands of years. It is a mystery to me why more people have avoided the results of that change than have embraced it. Let's embrace it today. Let's pray, shall we? Father, all of us here think sometimes that other people are the problem. We ask that you would forgive us for that. We recognize we're making them into gods. We're giving them power that should only belong to you. Help us learn to heal from that insanity. Teach us, Father, to see in our lives and the circumstances that we inhabit right now with the people that are a part of that circumstance. Teach us to see as Christ would. Opportunities to love, opportunities to give, opportunities to grace and to forgive. Father, raise us up into the new life that you have created and made possible for us. Help us to be your children by being obedient to your commands and by walking in your spirit. Forgive us for our foolishness as we forgive those who have sinned against us for theirs. Father, set the captives free here in this place today through this spirit of Holy Communion. It is in the beautiful and the powerful name of our true God, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. So we serve Holy Communion in several different ways uh, because uh, that's just what we do. If you have a cold or you're uh, otherwise inclined, um, we have communion in little plastic cups. You can come up and, and take them, take them to your seat, receive them, and there are trash cans on the way out. If you'd like to receive communion by intinction, intinction is uh, you come up, we'll hand you a piece of bread, you dip it into the cup. Please do not dip your finger clear into the juice. That's uh, too much sharing for any one Sunday morning. Just a little juice will do you, and then take it. Everybody clear on that? And you know your assignment? Right? In the depth of your heart, in all genuineness, you confess to God that you have let other people be your God and restore the right order today. Please, when you're ready, come forward.